Good day. We're going to take a little tour through the structures of the head, starting with the superficial structures. Here we see the horse with the skin removed. We see the platysma is still attached. We can actually identify the facial crest. Got to be very careful when removing the platysma because the buccal branches of cranial nerve 7 like just underneath that platysma. Here we see that now removed. There's the masseter muscle, the vader nasolabialis muscle. So that elevates the, the nose as well as the upper lip. Here we see the zygomaticus muscle. Here we see the parotid salivary gland. We have the dorsal buccal branch of cranial nerve 7 here and the ventral buccal branch here. In this image, we see them branching just as they're coming out from deep to the parotid salivary gland. Sometimes they will branch before they come out. Sometimes they will not branch until they get closer to the, the lateral canthus of the eye. When we do colic surgery, we have to be very concerned about the horse laying its head on its side for a long period of time, especially we don't want a halter to be on that head because a hard surface compressing upon those buccal branches of the facial nerve can cause facial nerve paralysis. And then you got to remember which way the deviation is, of the philtrum is going to occur, towards or away from the side of the lesion. So it's going to occur away from the side of the lesion because that side the muscle doesn't have tone and so it's going to be pulled to the unaffected side because that muscle still has tone. Remember the facial nerve is going to be the one that allows you to make faces so it's motor to the muscles of the face. Here we see the facial artery and vein coming up here. We'll have another view of that in just a sec. Now here looking just under the masseter muscle, we can see the parotid duct from the parotid salivary gland. Then we have the facial vein and the facial artery, and you always find them in that order. We'll see that the parotid duct does not cross the masseter muscle in either the horse or the ox, as we see in the dog. Here we can see ventral to the mandible, the mandibular lymph node. Here I'm going to give you a more ventral view. Here we see once again, there's the facial artery, facial vein, and here we reflect a little bit the parotid duct. And this shows the mandibular lymph nodes sitting here between the bodies of the mandible. It's important to remember these are the mandibular lymph nodes in the horse, whereas in the bovine, in that same region, we have the mandibular salivary glands. We'll come back to those in a little bit. Okay, once again, masseter muscle. Here we have the bucinator muscle. Bucinator muscle is important for returning the food from the oral vestibule back into the oral cavity, it's getting it back where they can chew on it. Now our the vader nasal labialis has been cut here and reflected downward to show the infraorbital nerve. Over here in the temporal region, we're going to see the auriculotemporal nerve and the transverse facial artery. We'll see in a little bit where those come from. So remember the auriculotemporal nerve is a branch of the mandibular nerve of the trigeminal. And so is that going to be sensory or motor? Remember the trigeminal is in general sensory, except the mandibular nerve gives motor to muscles of mastication. Okay, there's three places that we can take a pulse from a horse's head. The facial as it's coming around the mandible here is the most common, it's the easiest. 
Usually you will palpate that just on the medial side of the mandible. The transverse facial. And then just on the caudal edge of the mandible, you may find the masseteric. That one is sometimes a little bit harder to find. Okay, here's showing a skeleton. You see the facial crest. Now if we draw a line from the medial canthus of the eye parallel to that, just a little bit rostral to the end of the facial crest, we'll find the infraorbital frame. Okay, you can palpate on a live animal just that lateral edge of that foramen. Okay, here once again we see the levator nasal labialis reflected. We will have to elevate the levator labii superioris muscle. Remember this muscle is going to give us the flamen response in the horse by elevating that upper lip. And then we can see very nicely here the infraorbital nerve that comes through that infraorbital foramen. So is this going to be motor or sensory? Remember, this is a branch of the maxillary nerve. And so while it's within the infraorbital canal, it's going to give branches to the cheek teeth. It'll continue deep in that canal to go to the canines and the upper incisors. So to anest those upper canines and upper incisors, we'd want to inject our anesthesia within that infraorbital foramen. This portion we see externally here that comes out of the foramen is going to innervate the muzzle, so this will be sensory nerve. Okay, looking at the bovine skull now, we're going to see that if we come up here to the nasoincisive notch and then drop ventral to that and rostral to the facial tuberosity, we're going to find the infraorbital foramen there. Looking on the specimen, right about there is where the facial tuberosity is. Here we see it here, very large, just as it is in the horse. But remember in the bovine, this does not innervate the upper incisors and canine teeth because there are no upper incisors and canine teeth in the bovine. Okay, now here we're, we're showing there's the depressor labii inferioris muscle. This we will actually reflect dorsally to find generally just caudal to the caudal margin of the lips. We'll find the mental nerve. So this nerve is coming from which nerve? That's right, it's coming from the inferior alveolar nerve, which is going to innervate the cheek teeth. We'll continue within the canal to innervate the lower incisors and the mental nerve here is going to go to the lower lip and chin and once again because this is from the mandibular nerve this is going to be sensory okay coming back up here to the temporal region in this image we see that the auriculopalpebral nerve coming off the facial nerve is crossing over the zygomatic arch at this point and so it is palpable here on the live animal. Now is this motor or sensory? Remember the facial is what allows you to make faces and so it's going to be motor and this portion here is going to be motor to the orbicularis oculi, the levator nasal labialis and so this is the one that needs to be anesthetized for eye surgery to stop the animal from blinking. Okay, yes, this is a canine. So identify the structure at the arrow. Yep, this is the prodded duct. Remember we said in the large animal, the prodded duct does not cross the masseter muscle like it does in the dog. Okay, so here's the facial nerve. There's the auriculopalpebral nerve coming off the facial nerve dorsal buccal branch of the facial nerve, the ventral buccal branch. In the bovine, that ventral buccal branch is going to course 
more ventrally as we see here. The auriculotemporal nerve is usually a little deeper and a little more rostral to the auriculopalpebral nerve. And just as we see here where it is giving a branch that joins the dorsal buccal nerve, we're going to see that also occur in the horse and in the ox. And there's a prodiduct. Okay, so now we're looking back at the horse. We see the facial nerve here, auriculopalpebral nerve coming off it here, auriculotemporal nerve, just as I described in the dog. It's going to be located a little more rostral, a little bit deeper than auriculopalpebral. And we can see here the branch that joins the dorsal buccal nerve. So that's basically going to follow those branches of the dorsal buccal nerve to provide sensory, whereas the dorsal buccal nerve is providing motor. So the auriculotemporal nerve is going to be sensory to the guttural pouch, the parotid gland, the external ear, the tympanic membrane of the ear, and the skin of the cheek. Okay, so there's the dorsal buccal branch there, the ventral buccal branch the facial nerve there. So let's have a look at the bovine now. So we're looking at the left side instead of the right side. Here we see the masseteric artery going into the masseter muscle. The transverse facial artery. So the transverse facial is not as dorsal as what we saw in the horse. The transverse facial comes off the superficial temporal artery. Remember the superficial temporal artery is one of the terminal branches of the external carotid. The other terminal branch is the, the maxillary artery. Here we see the dorsal buccal branch of cranial nerve 7. And here we see that communicating branch from the auriculotemporal joining that. Okay, here we're looking at the horse. We dissected a little more of the Prodded salivary gland to expose, tucked a little bit deeper, and generally kind of tucked under the mandible there is going to be the mandibular salivary gland. Okay, we're going to find that in the horse we only have the polystomatic sublingual salivary glands. Okay, also right here we see deep to the salivary glands the digastricus muscle, this portion that originates off the pericondylar process to insert on the body of the mandible is referred to as the occipital mandibularis muscle, which is the caudal belly of the digastricus. Remember that is the only muscle that acts to open the jaw. Okay, here we're looking at the bovine. See the masseter muscle, prodded salivary gland is quite extensive, as is the mandibular salivary gland. Remember that mandibular salivary gland tucks ventrally between the bones of the mandible. We can see the mandibular lymph node is going to be a little bit different hue and less lobulated, and it just kind of sits buried in the more lateral portion of that mandibular salivary gland. Here we have the parotid duct, and then the facial artery and vein. So very similar course of the duct and the facial artery and vein is what we saw in the horse. There's the dorsal buccal branch of the facial nerve. The ventral buccal branch courses down here with the parotid duct and the facial artery very similar to how it coursed in the dog. There's our parotid lymph node, generally buried in the rostral border of the parotid salivary gland. Once again, it's going to have a different coloration, different U, and it's going to be not as lobulated. Here we have the auriculotemporal nerve and the transverse facial artery once again. So in this view here, 
You see the parotid salivary gland. There's a mandibular salivary gland. You see the mandibular lymph node on the lateral edge of that. But if we reflect that parotid salivary gland rostrally, we see here basically near the wing of the atlas, the lateral retropharyngeal lymph nodes. And that's what I got for you for the superficial structures of the head.